Hello, I'm Dr. Julie Gerberding. I'm an Executive Vice President at MSD and the Chief Patient Officer. I'm Seth Berkeley, uh, CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Hi, my name is Sang Yap Lee. I'm professor and dean at KAIST Korea. I work on uh, engineering microorganisms for the production of anything useful. Jeremy Farrar, head of Wellcome Trust. So I'm going to ask you all to enter into the willing suspension of disbelief. Okay. We're sort of setting the stage for this. Uh, all right, it is the 15th of November of last year. You're in London, you're at home, it's Sunday morning, you're reading the Times of London, and on the fifth page, in the bottom, there's a four-sentence article. You just happen to pick up, and it says that in a country in Central Africa, there have been reported two respiratory deaths uh, from an illness that the locals didn't understand, and they had an autopsy, and they still haven't figured it out. So I'm going to ask you, raise your hand. How many people would think, oh, that's interesting. I'm not going to change anything in my life. Or how many people say, this is important. I'm going to do something different. Right. OK, that was the 15th of November. It's January 1st, New Year's Day. You're reading the paper. And now, right on the inside, it says page two. It's a four-paragraph um, article, same country. These deaths have expanded. There were two before. Now there are 10 people who have died. Same illness. And in that interval, experts have been brought in from around the world. The tissue has been widely disseminated. No one knows what caused these deaths. Totally unknown. And the new cases had no clear epidemiological link to the two that had been reported earlier. That's all it says in the article. Anybody scared yet? No. Nah. OK. The third scenario. This is the last of the three. Um, it's February 1st. <clears throat> You're just back from the World Economic Forum. You're reading a newspaper. Now it's the front page, below the fold. And it turns out that there are 300 deaths there from this mysterious illness, still yet to be identified, called disease X. One of the people who was sick but not yet died had been there from an NGO who had gone to see to figure out what was happening, had seen and examined some of the patients and tissues, had attended the World Economic Forum, <laughs> where you had been. And it had been pretty clear that there was a two-week period during which you were asymptomatic but could communicate the disease. That person was at the World Economic Forum when you were there at a time when the disease could have been communicated. Are you panicked yet? <laughs> <laughs> you should be. Uh, that disease is disease X. Their World Health Organization, it's time to, you can have disbelief back now. Uh, the World Health Organization has a list of diseases about which we need to do more research to understand their biology and how to mitigate them. But they added to the list disease X. Now, disease X can be a biological disease that came from natural selection, as it were, jumped to humans, and we haven't yet identified it. In that case, it's usually part of a known family, and you could begin to understand its behavior by knowing how the family members behave. But it's also possible that somebody engineered disease X, made it in their basement laboratory. Fairly sophisticated laboratory, but we'll talk about that in the panel, and they were trying to get rid of some of the people they didn't like in this Central African country with this disease. They thought it would die out. They didn't realize um, that it would have this kind of potential. So as we think about biological threats, it's important to understand uh, that this is actually a scenario that could be true. To do this could happen. I'm not trying to scare you, but we're trying to say, what should we be doing what should we be thinking about when we live in a world where this is possible? So I was going to talk, ask Jeremy to sort of fill us in on what happens when something's released in the environment. 
we've got the experts um, sitting to comment. So, so what Jeff describes is, is not actually that fanciful. If you go back uh, 2004, 2005, in January 2004, 2005, um, <laughs> A very good friend of mine, Carlo Urbani, died in Hanoi um, of SARS. Um, in doing so, uh, closed a hospital and protected a country of 100 million people from suffering from SARS. But over the course of the next few days and weeks, exactly as uh, Jeff's just describing, not starting in sub-Saharan Africa, but starting in southern China and then spreading through Hong Kong to Vietnam and then to Toronto and Frankfurt, that's what happened. Uh, a respiratory pathogen uh, spread around the world and caused enormous uh, health and also economic situations. So that, this happens. This is a, a, a mock-up of what it would actually look like. This is thanks to Neil Ferguson. This is January coming through of a flu-like epidemic spreading around the world through January through August. And it would effectively go around the world in a very short number of weeks. Um, international travel will take it essentially everywhere. Uh, and it is what most people worry about. A respiratory pathogen, which I may be incubating today and not yet have symptoms, but be maximally, ab <coughs> have the ability to transmit. With, the, with SARS, uh, in fact, you were symptomatic when you were most likely to transmit, and so therefore you could isolate those individuals as Carlo Urbani did and stop the thing spreading. But there are many other infectious diseases, of which flu is one, where you may well be symptomatic before uh, actually, you are known to be, you be asymptomatic whilst you have the ability to transmit. And that's the thing you really worry about. And it is, of course, just over 100 years since the world suffered somewhere between 40 and 60 million deaths from an influenza pandemic that went around the world before there was air airline travel and before even the World Economic Forum existed. And the world is changing, and, it, and it's changing dramatically, and this will have a dramatic impact on uh, infectious diseases and how they may spread, and the risks, the threat, and the vulnerabilities that the world is. This is the Ebola River in 1976, with the first outbreak of Ebola. And in Ebola in 1976, when it first described, Peter Piot was involved. Uh, it was in a r very rural community in the Democratic <coughs> Republic of Congo. And a, a person with Ebola came into contact with somewhere between eight and 10 other individuals. Fast forward to 2014 to Freetown uh, in West Africa and this is the scenario. The virus hasn't necessarily changed, the host genetics has not changed, the immunological profile has not changed. What's happened is society has changed and that eight to ten contacts of somebody with Ebola in 1976 turned into somewhere between 250 and 300. And trying to control an epidemic by isolating cases, looking after their contacts, offering vaccination when you're in this scenario can work when you can close off a village or as Carlo Urbani did, close off a hospital. It becomes impossible when you have big urban centers where disease transmits. And this is the world of today. And this is why in 2014 Ebola took off in West Africa and why in southern China through SARS there was such an explosion in the SARS epidemic in southern China because it was happening in major urban centers. And this is the connectivity. What Jeff forgot to say is, of course, when you're at WEF, when this happens, you then developed a cough. That's usually at this time in the audience, somebody <coughs> coughs for me, thanks very much. Um, and then you know you're sick. But this is the connectivity. You all know this. People in this room travel more than your average citizen of the world and their ability to transfer anything around the world is magnified in a way that wasn't uh, in all of our early lifetime. And this is the reality of where these things start. Um, this is a pretty good clinical facility in West Africa in 2014. This is looking after day-to-day -day cases of malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, and you've got to bear in mind that many of those symptoms that you have with SARS or indeed with Ebola do not come in saying, I've got SARS or I've got Ebola. They come in looking like pneumonia. They come in looking like influenza. They come in looking like malaria. And it looks very similar. And even as a clinical infectious disease person, it's very difficult to distinguish that. And the weight of patients and the demand on people's time is such that whilst it may sound silly sitting here in Davos to say, well, hold on. Why can't these people just work out what that initial outbreak was? 
The truth is, these are the sort of conditions people are working in. And to add to that, you're now working increasingly, whether it was the cholera outbreak in Yemen or Ebola currently in DRC, you're working in a, in a world which is becoming increasingly fragmented, where conflict is common, and where there is a tremendous mistrust between society and the governed and the governing. In Eastern DRC at the moment, where Ebola is taking off, uh, there is very little trust for the government of Kinshasa. And so therefore, trying to move into that environment with a trusting relationship of, whether it be the World Health Organization or MSF, or indeed the government of DRC, and persuading people to do things that they would not otherwise do is extraordinarily difficult. And again, whilst that may seem as though that may be just something in DRC, the truth is, if you imagine that happening in New York, or London, or Geneva, or Washington, and would people just stay whilst the authorities said? In the current world of mistrust again, I suspect that many people would just vote with their feet and, and move, uh, and perhaps not accept. And conflict. Trying to deal with emerging infectious diseases in peacetime is extraordinarily difficult. This was the helicopter uh, transporting around in over New Year in DRC, and this was the rear gunner, Surge, from Kiev in the Ukraine. Um, and the helicopter can't just land like this, it has to go like this because you're avoiding bullets as you're coming into the WHO based in Eastern DRC. So that's the world scenario. This epidemic's occurring both in context of urbanization and climate change driving new areas where epidemics drive, but also happening in areas where there is tremendous mistrust between communities and where there is frank conflict is extraordinarily difficult. And I don't think we've got our head around how do we deal and how do we deliver a public health response when we're in regions of tremendous mistrust and sometimes, mm -hmm. frankly, uh, war scenarios. And this is the environment in DRC today, which is the center of the epidemic here. Rural communities linked to big urban communities and across four borders. And four borders which not, are not naturally necessarily talking to each other all of the time. And these are happening all the time. Virus alerts, this is in a week, uh, alerts coming into the WHO, sifting through this information and deciding what is important and what is not is extraordinarily difficult. It is very difficult to tell that case of eight cases of a respiratory illness that Jeff talked about, what of those is important when you've got 50 of those coming in this week and, and they're all around the world? How do you decide what's important and what's not? So that's the situation we're in today. We've made tremendous progress in the last few years. We've uh, pushed the whole research and development agenda. So, in fact, we do now have Ebola vaccines from Merck, MSD, and from Johnson & Johnson and others. We've made tremendous progress in that. We've made tremendous progress in linking the research endeavor with the humanitarian response. WHO has responded in 2018 much quicker than it did in 2014. But there are still tensions and a lack of coordination the humanitarian response, the NGO, is not used to working with the research world. They're not used to working with the military. Sometimes there will be frank tension there. And until we're able to coordinate that much better, I don't think we'll be able to respond to the epidemics that we have uh, and we're likely to face in the next decade. And all of this comes back, in fact, to having the capacity, and this is where universal health coverage becomes so important, and where the work of, of uh, Seth here and, and the Global Fund and Gavi become so important in ensuring that the universal health coverage is at the places that need it most and have the capacity to deal with day-to-day -day issues and then the capacity to surge when something else goes wrong. And without that basic infrastructure, wherever you live, you'll be dependent on what happens in that health station in eastern DRC, southern China, or Indonesia. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. So um, when you have an epidemic, the first part is to know you have an epidemic. How do you know that? Uh, we've just heard from Jeremy that there's surveillance ongoing all the time. Uh, but the first question is recognizing and then uh, identifying. So Seth, how do you know? We, we don't get a letter saying, you know, there's an epidemic ongoing. We need to figure it out. But what happens? So, uh, Mike's working, okay. Um, so, great, great introduction, Jeremy, and you even scared me. But, um, I mean, if, if we start off with, I mean, if we're lucky in the world, 
this occurs in a place that has a good laboratory system, has a surveillance system, has health workers in place, and has a sophisticated enough crew to be able to go and, you know, investigate, collect specimens if necessary, have a lab to analyze them, or if not, send them to somewhere. And I'm sure Julie will jump in because she ran one of the premier institutions in the world who would be a recipient. But the truth is, is if you look at places, and you started here in Central African Republic, when you do an assessment of the readiness, the skill set that's there, it's really quite poor. And one of the challenges is surveillance is not sexy. Now, one of the reasons we do have surveillance today is because for some of the vaccine-preventable diseases, particularly polio, we're at the end stage of a push to try to eradicate polio in the world. So there are labs that are doing tests and have uh, funding for that and have reagents that are regularly there. You know, polio hopefully will soon end. And one of the questions is, as they go away, what will happen to that routine surveillance? And, and one of the questions for the world is going to be, do we believe that every place ought to have these teams, ought to have the basic capabilities, even if they can't do the sophisticated lab test, to be able to do that? And the one thing I want to say that slightly different than, than Jeremy said is, he pointed out the urban issue in in um, the outbreak in West Africa. But what, what happened was the original case, the point case, was in a rural area, but it was in a rural area between three countries that had been you know, war-torn in the past. It was initially misdiagnosed as multiple different conditions, as he described. And so the delay from the time that case occurred until people figured out that was Ebola. It was a, Ebola was not something that they had seen in that part of West Africa before. By the time that happened, then the spread had already occurred. So, you know, in a sense, we need to be as strong as the weakest link. So, Julie, uh, in the uh, really developed world, in the U.S., how, do, did, how good if we had a case of Ebola that showed up without the fanfare that did in 2014, how long do you think it would take to identify it, and what is in place to safeguard people in the, in the first world? Well, as you may recall, when the West African Ebola outbreak was ongoing in 2014, we did have a case of Ebola arrive in the United States unannounced, and it took a while for people to realize that's what they were dealing with. One of the important lessons from that experience was that we are only as strong as our weakest link. And it is the frontline clinician who is often the most important person in the detection and response because the frontline clinician, first and foremost, needs to take an exposure history when someone presents with an unidentified infectious disease, regardless of um, where they came from. And particularly if that person has recently arrived from another country or has someone in their household who's recently arrived from another part of the world. So that was the, a, a really critical lesson learned there. Um, once you have a suspect case, in the United States, fortunately, we do have a very sophisticated laboratory network system supported by the CDC and the state and local public health laboratory networks that are equipped to diagnose the pathogens that are on the select agent list as well as the pathogens that are on the list of worrisome uh, global pathogens of pandemic, uh, pandemic importance. Unfortunately, you know, virus mm -hmm. X yeah. would not be something that would be diagnosed because you can't diagnose it if you don't have um, awareness of the pathogen in the test. So um, for Ebola, I think if we had a suspicion of a case, it's a relatively easy uh, diagnosis to make. And in addition to what the state lab could do, it would be very quickly confirmed at the CDC. So you have an outbreak, and you borrow a line from Casablanca. You round up the usual suspects. and. It's, you don't find out who the culprit is. So uh, Lee, how likely is it that someone could make up disease X in their laboratory, uh, release oh it God. into the environment? Why am I given with this difficult task? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's not too difficult, frankly speaking, which is uh, a little bit terrible. But uh, rapid advances in uh, DNA synthesis, which brought the uh, cost of DNA synthesis down to say, nine cents per base pair, so which will be uh, translated into a typical toxin gene size of two kilo base pairs to synthesize with uh, $200. And then you can transform into a common laboratory 
bacterium like E. coli, mm -hmm. your gut bacterium, and then let them produce those toxins. And likewise, you can reshuffle viral genomes, which I hope will not happen ever whatsoever, because it's so dangerous. I mean, imagine the situation of uh, merging the beneficial, from viral point of view, beneficial uh, phenotypes of uh, widespreadness of influenza and the lethality of Ebola. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be any human left. So it's not very good. However, of course, scientists and engineers are working hard to countermeasure it. One problem we all agree is that 10 policemen cannot uh, keep one thief away. It's very difficult. So attack point is always easier. So we have to have a preventive measures already in place to prevent it. Otherwise, our capability to uh, make such dangerous agents mm -hmm. overall is now happening. And hopefully, we can educate uh, scientists and engineers, especially at the student level, better so that they are fully equipped with 100% uh, ethics and humanity so that such a thing will never, ever happen. Seth? Uh, you know, it's interesting because we, we talk about lethality and, and uh, how is di Ebola diagnosed today in Africa? Well, here's what happens. Somebody comes in, as Jeremy described, with a fever and they get misdiagnosed. And then the healthcare team that took care of them gets sick. And then they get taken care of by another healthcare team. And that healthcare team gets sick and a lot of them die. And we know it's Ebola. Of course, we don't want that to happen, and the vaccine that's now there hopefully will be able to ultimately do preventive vaccination of healthcare workers and prevent them from doing that. But you know, this is a disease that you know, kills people, and you, you can see that in front of you. But it's interesting. In a scary way of society, take a different disease, HIV. When HIV first appeared, it spread, it doesn't make you sick at the beginning. And so what that means is you have the ability to spread dramatically, and in that particular case, as long as 10 years before you started having symptoms. So in that, it was a sexually transmitted disease. It wasn't the easiest disease to transmit, but that's why there was dramatic spread even before people identified it. And when the first cases began to appear, people went back and said, well, how long has this been around? And it had been around a while, but you know, clinicians didn't know about it. There was wasting or diarrhea or other symptoms are thought to be TB or real TB. And so, you know, one of the challenges is if you wanted to make the thing, you might want to make it to kill people, but, if, you know, if you really wanted to have an effective say in nature for disease X and spread would be to have it silent for a long period of time. And if I could just add, not to scare people, but one of the... But you should, yeah. <laughs> one of the things that concerns me where we are right now in the DRC is that there's a war going on there, a, a terrorist war, a guerrilla war of sorts, tribal war, and it is entirely within the realm of my imagination that infected humans could be used as weapons um, to send somebody who's known to harbor the virus into another community or another neighborhood. Right across the, the river in Uganda is one of the largest and most difficult refugee camps in the world. Imagine if Ebola was introduced into that refugee camp. So, you know, it's not, you don't even have to make something new. You can just change the way that something is transmitted and accomplish some pretty diabolical tasks. And, and I think uh, because this is time of scaring people, let me just add one more thing before we <laughs> sort of move to uh, some better, better uh, dialogue. So not only the uh, sending people, but one of the uh, advantages from the uh, terrorist point of view of using biological weapons is it's cheap to make. It doesn't cost tens of millions of dollars. It just costs thousand bucks to make uh, bacillus anthracis uh, uh, into a lethal amount. And then it's very easily transferable. You can just put it on your, your uh, clothes because you're already vaccinated, go to a local area, produce them, and use it. And you can, be, you can be shipping these agents through airmail or from the uh, water pipe. So it's just deployment is so easy. And that's why it's so attractive from the uh, terrorist point of view. And that's why you know, we are in this uh, difficult era of preventing them. So uh, Jeremy, part of your organization does a lot of work with uh, these types of pathogens. Uh, what's your take on the likelihood of a new illness, one created by man, versus one created by nature, who is out there just enjoying herself 
changing things all the time to make our life interesting. So I, I, you know, I, I don't disagree with what's been said, and, and it, particularly in the current context, um, being concerned about biological weapons being used is, uh, the world has to be concerned about that. But Mother Nature is pretty big out there. Um, and we already know that we have a, a number of real threats there, some of which we've had for centuries, and I keep bringing up influenza. Um, it has the ability to, to live in an animal reservoir. It has the ability to swip it, switch its genes around. It is, it is easy to think about influenza uh, recreating a 1918 -like scenario in a world that is totally connected. Um, so whilst I do not dismiss the worries of bioterrorism, um, if I was quantifying it, I would focus hugely on Mother Nature and use the skills you learn there to address the bioterrorism threat. Um, and on this side, on Mother Nature side, we, we've, uh, Robin's here and Wendy's here, I mean, we've got to get quicker at both identification, diagnostics, but we've then got to get quicker at moving to having countermeasures that are in place and can be used. And at the moment, we have a regular, we have a challenge at the upside of that scientifically, and then we have an enormous challenge on the regulatory pathway to getting drugs, diagnostics, and, and vaccines into populations that would need them in the time frame that you described in your introduction. And we have to have countermeasures that have a time scale that's consistent with the threat, not one that we can say, well, we'll come back in 10 years' time and we'll have a vaccine for you. And can I just bring one other, um, because you talked about changing in, in agents. One of the things we're also seeing now is you know, the, the measures we had to control these diseases are going away. So we recently had an outbreak in, in Pakistan of typhoid. Um, it's a well-known disease, been around forever, used to have a 20% mortality rate um, with antibiotics, you know, less than 1%. And this particular strain is resistant to five of the six antibiotics. So you get resistant to that sixth antibiotic, and now you're back to a 20% mortality rate. Luckily, there is a vaccine, and so you can go in now and use that measure for that. But in the interim, before it started, there was a case uh, to the UK, there was a case to the US, and more and more we're beginning to see this rapid movement of pathogens and diseases, not just new ones, but old ones that have resistance. TB is another example of one that does that. So uh, before we get into the, the treatment and mitigation, uh, I want to ask Julie about uh, blowing the whistle. Uh, because we don't get a letter saying there's an epidemic going on, we have to sort of wait till we decide there's a threshold that's been crossed. If the threshold's too low, we'll be blowing the epidemic whistle once a week and people will stop listening. If the threshold's too high, there will be lots of uh, pathology that could have been avoided. And so you're in this really difficult position. You were in this really difficult position. When do you decide to throw the switch? Well, there are guidelines that the WHO uses to try to um, determine the level of threat that's present and scale um, recommendations about public health interventions accordingly. But having been, um, I would just use, for example, SARS as, as, a, as a case in point. Um, the problem emerged somewhere else, not in the US. Um, we had incomplete information. At the time, we couldn't get samples to the CDC because no, airline, no commercial airline pilot would fly them out of fear of contamination of the aircraft. They sat on the tarmac in Bangkok for quite a while, mm -hmm. um, so delayed um, a great deal of the early virology work. So we were desperately trying to get information out of a region of the world that wasn't transparent about reporting cases. And thank goodness for Dr. Urbani, because he really blew the whistle on what was going on, didn't know what caused it, but he knew there was an unusual outbreak that couldn't be explained by pathogens that would normally be transmitted in that pattern. So we paid attention to the reports coming out of Vietnam, and we leaned in. And, and I, I remember um, the day um, that the WHO made the decision to declare um, an international health threat. Um, the CDC Emergency Operations Center was already operational. We had already alerted the US government, the secretary, the president, and others that we thought this was imminent and what we thought the initial steps should be. So we, you, know, you have to, behind the scenes, be poised. But I agree, um, you need to get as much information as you can assemble quickly. And 
my own style of risk communication in those situations is to tell the truth. Um, so if there's something out there, or rumors are out there, you know, to say what you know and say what you don't know and tell people what you're doing to try to get the information you need and promise to update them as soon as you have it. So you'll get on television and say, we have no idea what this is, we have no idea how it's transmitted, we have no idea what to do to treat it. I would not recommend that approach. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what, what you do is you say, there are reports of an unusual cluster of pneumonia in Vietnam. Uh, the WHO and CDC investigators are there. Um, they've obtained samples from these patients. They're working with the local health authorities, contacting our partners in the collaborating laboratories that exist in Asia. Um, we don't have samples yet, but we expect to get them right. as soon as possible. Um, and right now, we are not implementing any unusual travel recommendations or precautions because we don't think it's necessary, but as we learn more, we'll update you. Uh, and that uh, virus was identified in Hong Kong, if I uh, know correctly, and is that because they had the samples before the rest of the world? Oh, you hit a sore spot. <laughs> Um, yeah, th this was something that made me very unpopular among the scientists at CDC because it, actually the CDC and the Hong Kong scientists discovered or uh, reported the coronavirus that caused SARS basically in the same 24-hour period, but Hong Kong was definitely first to, to um, report the etiology. And part of the reason for that was even though the CDC scientists really believed they knew um, the pathogen, we wanted to fulfill some criteria that are necessary in, in a traditional framework for causality. Mm -hmm. And we were Low waiting to for an animal uh, model study results to come back from our collaborators in Europe. And we couldn't, I wouldn't report until I had the third box checked. So um, I thought it was better to be right than first. Mm -hmm. um, we'd already seen what happens when another group of scientists prematurely declared that a different cause was associated with the outbreak. So that caused a great loss of credibility and damage to the confidence in the whole public health system. And I thought that was not a mistake we wanted to make at CDC. And then, and then six months later, after that, SARS finished whenever it did, Julie, and then six months later, um, on the eve of Tet, so that must have been about now, uh, mm -hmm. end of January, six months later, um, I was asked to see a small girl at a, at a pet duck, and she'd buried it, and came in with a severe respiratory infection, which we thought was actually the coming back of SARS. It, if it wasn't for the taking of that history, mm -hmm. which mm. led us down it being H5N1, and that was the start of the bird. Bad enough. Um, <laughs> which was bad enough. Um, but I remember that scarred on my back at the time. Yeah. Um, but also, I, I think it raised a really important issue, and, and that was, and there are colleagues here from China, um, SARS was a wake-up call to China as well. And, and actually, I have to pay tribute to what China's done subsequently, although I think there are questions at the moment about sharing of H7 and not, um, H7. Um, but, but China, after SARS, put in place a much more robust public health system and reporting, particularly of respiratory infections, than was true pre-SARS. And whilst not perfect, has become much more transparent about what is going on now than pre-SARS. I think it's fair to say that uh, viruses actually don't care about borders. They'll go where, wherever they can go. No and, visas. And, right? and, and you don't know they're there. They sort of sneak in. All right, so we've now made it to the identification. The next is uh, treatment. SARS was a great case in point. There were lots of treatments that people were trying, um, none of which we really sure worked. We had the same uh, with Ebola. Uh, because when you have an epidemic like this, you have, what can I do to help the people who are known to be afflicted? And then what can I do to prevent more cases? We'll get to you with the prevention. Uh, but uh, Jeremy, you know, when you're in one of these situations and you have a disease that, like SARS, which was new at the time, what, what do you do? You're a physician, you want to help that person. It's just a guessing game. It's, it is just a guessing game, but, I, but I would, again, just to, you know, put a note of optimism in, you know, I think it's not perfect, but, but it was completely ad hoc in 2003, 2004, 2005, both for SARS and also for influenza, actually. And, and, and there were a whole pile of things that were done, some sensible, some not sensible. There was no coordination of that. There was no organized structure. There was no uh, randomization. There was no clinical trial done. 
if you come through to now, today, and again, it's not perfect, many people in this room have contributed to this, but today in DRC, despite those soldiers and everything else, I think off the top of my head, about 55 or 60 people have been enrolled in randomized control trials of four therapeutics for Ebola, um, it, a, a, according to a standard protocol, and results will be gained. And shifting this sense that we're responding to a single epidemic to a sense that we're gonna look for a five-year period at every single Ebola outbreak, and we'll, uh, <coughs> at the end of five years, we will have an answer of whether any of the therapeutics work. So I think where the world has shifted um, is to being better prepared to, to, to start clinical trials, to have protocols in place that can be rolled out and where patients can be recruited and consented much earlier than would have been the case five years ago. Right. We, so we have to push that even further than where we are today. Okay. So we've learned lessons in five years. Uh, who is the we, and do we have everybody in the we we need, or should we be adding more people um, to make this more effective? So you've always got this tension between you want to be inclusive and you want everybody in the tent, but trying to corral a big tent is a challenge. Um, uh, where I would like to get to, because th there is disease X, but there's also all the things that we know about that could cause a really horrible outbreak of drug-resistant typhoid, for instance, would be very nasty. I think where we need to get to for the things we know about is to have protocols ready to, uh, to have um, ethical approvals in the region where they're most likely to be, buy-in from local communities so that patients can be recruited and offered treatment immediately that epidemics start. We're not there yet today, but that's where I think we have to get to. And, and can I just add one thing? Because one really important point is a, a world of trust. And it's hard in these circumstances to have trust, but if you have trust, you can move much quicker. And on the Ebola treatments, I mean, there were companies who had you know, dr drug therapies, ethical, look good in animals, good safety profiles, packed and ready to go. And the challenge was waiting for the approvals and work in that setting. And you know, the more we develop a situation where people think about this ahead of time, and there is a trust developed, the faster we can go, which has effects in the situation. And you know, if you look at Ebola in the past, here was the story. Bring your loved ones to the treatment center. They will be locked in an isolation chamber, and they may die alone a horrible death. They may not die, but they may die alone a horrible death. And by the way, you know, normally people take care of your, your, your relatives in that setting. All of a sudden, you change the dynamic if you say, you know what, bring, bring your mom, because there's some treatment that might work. We don't know, but there's some treatment, there's some evidence. It changes that dynamic. I mean, we saw that in HIV. I mean, you know, many of I was went through the early phases of the HIV epidemic in, when I was living in London at that time, and, and there was a lot of mistrust. Why, why would you even, you know, in the early days of HIV, why would I go to a hospital? Because the stigma associated with HIV, there's no treatment anyone can offer me. As soon as you get treatment, it changes the dynamic, and, oh. and it changes this sense of trust, and we're not just going to lock you away and hopefully bury you nicely, but actually we can offer you some hope. That, that changes everything. So Ritanavir, in the beginning of treatment that made it, they could diminish the viral load, made a difference in HIV. And people started, instead of being a death sentence, they could have a life sentence. All right, so we now have some idea of the treatments. Uh, and the things that are on our known list, right? You, you have this epidemic, and if it's checked off to be known, and the thing that's on the World Health Organization list, one of the reasons they're there is that research needs to be done for mitigating treatments, things like CCRF and uh, another a, a bunch of other viral diseases. But what about prevention? That's always better if you can prevent. That gets into the vaccine arena. So, Seth, uh, where are we with respect to uh, known diseases like Ebola? And where are we with respect to diseases that have no vaccine yet? And how would we make a vaccine to disease X? So first thing to say, it's critical to get existing vaccines out, and that builds the system, and the surveillance system for vaccine-preventable diseases then becomes a surveillance system you can use for unusual infections as well. So I think that's the, the, the core at the beginning. But to, to specifically answer your question, in a sense, we were somewhat lucky with Ebola because Ebola had a lot of work done ahead of time, and um, there had been, it, it had been seen as a bioterrorism organism, and so work had been done around that. And so when the West African outbreak occurred, there was 
um, there were vaccines that had been worked on to some degree, and then there was a heroic effort, and that's the only way to describe it, of the, of the drug companies who worked 24-7 to kind of drive forward to make the products and get them ready, and the story is we ended up with a vaccine that had 100% efficacy. Um, that's still not licensed, but um, we launched two years ago, Julie and I actually here, um, it was three years ago, an advanced purchase commitment to um, have a stockpile available in case there was another outbreak. The challenge is, how do we do that really quickly? And um, uh, then um, uh, Richard uh, Hatchett, who's in the audience here, CEPI was launched here, and the idea there was to go down that list that WHO had put in front of us and to try to make vaccines for those. There is a challenge, because what's the incentive for companies? A lot of small companies can engage because it'd be a good name for them, but big companies, it takes away from them. And then the question is, who's going to pay for it if it's for very poor countries and you know we may but are we set up to do that for many different organisms so these are some of the questions that we need the last point that's important though is how do we create platform technologies kind of get them pre-approved so we can rapidly when disease x appears go ahead and 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 do the biotechnological work to plug it in to a platform technology that we know how to manufacture and work and be able to produce a vaccine quicker in the case of a severe outbreak and these are some of the challenges we have. The last thing I'd say is that for flu, you know, it's a, it's a big challenge. We still, it's, it's really slow. Most flu vaccines in the world today are still made on eggs. You know, if you went back, you would be familiar with that. It's not very efficient. Obviously, you got to worry about bird flu, et cetera. And the challenge is, can we create, you know, for example, universal flu vaccines, flu vaccines that can be made rapidly so that in the case of an explosive outbreak, we'd be able to scale up rapidly. But it's hard. It is, it is, but just, you know, ever the optimist, um, Seth may not like me for this, but over the last 20 or so, we've, we've been struggling with some really difficult infectious diseases we want vaccines for, tuberculosis, malaria, HIV. Um, and dare I say it's the vaccines in the, the vaccinologists in the room, it has led to a slightly pessimistic scenario. There are quite a lot of diseases out there where making a vaccine is not quite so challenging. And one of the lessons I took away from Ebola in 2014-15 is actually with MSD support, a vaccine was made. And so there are some diseases out there, of which I think Ebola is one, which are eminently vaccinatable for. And I, what I would argue is actually CEPI and others and then pulling through with Gavi, this could really re-energize re the vaccine community out there to, from a relatively pessimistic scenario of almost impossible vaccines, to actually one where these are actually achievable. And that may have a really knock-on positive impact on the whole vaccine world. I completely agree with Jeremy. There's just one more piece that really is a conundrum, and I know Seppi is working on this, but let's say we had them all um, proof of concept for anything we thought we could know about and produce. Manufacturing is a different dilemma because we're not talking about vaccines that everybody's going to get, with maybe the exception of flu. We're talking about 300,000 doses, you know, maybe a million doses if we That's had a That's a small large, number in your... Yeah, it's a very small number of vaccine doses, a number that could be made in a couple of batches. And so you have to build a whole manufacturing facility, certify it, get the approvals from several regulatory agencies, um, make that vaccine, stockpile it for Gavi so it's available just in time as it's needed, but then you're done. And so then what do you do? You take that space, decommission it, put something else in there. Well, that's great as long as the vaccine has an infinite half-life in the stockpile, but usually they don't. So that means in a few years, you'd have to make it again, but you can't have a plant sitting there hot, ready to make the next thing. That just isn't the way the regulatory or the quality environment works. So we have a conundrum in terms of the whole cycle of countermeasure preparedness for vaccines. And that's something that we still have to continue to work on collectively. But this is something, again, to be optimistic about because new technologies come forward with disposal manufacturing. Other Don't be over optimistic. Right. 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 Although, <laughs> um, 10 years ago, I did a beta zone with Craig Ventner, and he said in six months, they were going to be able to make any vaccine exactly. in six weeks. And that was 10 years ago. It still hasn't happened. Yeah. All right, so we're going to open the floor to questions. But before we do, for those of you who are really into vaccines, tomorrow there's an ideas lab uh, from uh, the UK.
on a whole bunch of new approaches to vaccines. So if you really are into vaccines, come to that. It's going to be terrific. <laughs> uh, so now raise your hand, and somebody will bring a microphone, and you can ask questions. All right, we have uh, need the microphone up front. Don't, don't panic. It's coming soon. Thanks. Identify so be, yourself, please. Uh, Gary Cohen, BD. Uh, this will be half comment, half question, and that is I just want to mention something about CDC, which I've worked closely with for over a decade, of course, Julie led, that you, know, you started the, the conversation about what may scare us. What gives me confidence and comfort is the fact that the CDC exists. And whether people know it or not, they're on the front lines of every one of these outbreaks everywhere in the world, almost working undercover because they don't want to call attention themselves. They want to keep the focus on the national government. There are people run into the most dangerous situations. And probably very few people know that CDC actually has something called the corporate Roundtable on Global Health Threats, which I happen to chair, which coordinates with 30 of the largest employers in the world to engage employers and their workforces and their communication channels in the event of an outbreak. And during the time of the last influenza pandemic, there were bi-weekly exchanges of information and they meet face-to-face -face with the CDC director and other experts at CDC twice a year. All these things are happening quietly behind the scenes and the only thing CDC doesn't do well is promote how much it does because it's a very self-effacing agency. So the question now is, given that probably many people in this room are from the corporate sector, what more can be done through companies' own health provision, their own services uh, for their employees? Everybody will recall what happened with Firestone during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. They were the one health services facility, the company facility, that got things under control very quickly. Is there an untapped opportunity there, potentially? Well, I, I would say absolutely, Gary, and thank you for, um, for, the, for the information about the hidden CDC capabilities. Um, as we learned from Richard Edelman's trust barometer this week, my employer is the most trusted resource um, for information and um, expectation in 2019. And I think the em employers are extremely credible and resourceful sources of communication and information to a very large cascade of people and their families. But also employers, larger employers at least, have um, health services or access to health services that include travel services. And I've noticed that travel services usually include what you should do before you go someplace, but it doesn't always have a lot of information about what you should do when you come back or what you should look for or think about or who you should go to if you have a problem. So I think we could um, you know, improve the, the advice and information to return to <coughs> travelers so that we have an opportunity to perhaps to recognize and intervene more quickly. And in the case of a, of a serious pandemic, um, we are absolutely dependent on employers for planning continuity of operations and other um, countermeasure deployment, such as giving out antibiotics, et cetera. So we have to include employers as part of the overall private-public partnership for preparedness. Thank you very much. Um, Identify yourself. Oh, sorry. My name is Gadi, and I'm a cybersecurity guy. I, I don't want to use the word expert in this room when I'm facing such esteemed uh, personalities. I would like to request, if you don't mind, I will try to keep it at around 40 seconds, not including this introduction, that we go back to the beginning of the speech when you asked us to take a, a little bit of suspended disbelief, go into science fiction for a second. <laughs> and then we went from there and started talking about the issues in biology. So coming from cybersecurity, we face many of the same issues, whether it's about prevention, incident response. Many times, you, from what I hear, you don't really have prevention, you have detection and incident response. So we face a lot of the same issues. We try to use the same types of language as well, whether it's in, I'll skip. The point is, I've been in your shoes, in your chairs, many times in cybersecurity. And today, we don't necessarily see, especially in the world that you sit in, when it's operational, you have to deal with threats every day. You don't have time, energy, or budget to deal with anything else. In, in a, in, when both fields are asymmetrical in nature, in, in my view, and I'm going to contradict myself slightly, and we have a co-evolutionary arms race happening constantly, and with medical devices entering the field, I see we can see where I'm going. Today, I don't believe we even have a detection mechanism 
Meaning, if somebody did indeed use a pacemaker, there are a few million in the US alone, and in a few years, they will be connected to the internet for updates, for example, right? And there was some sort of warm upgrade through the internet. Again, this is science fiction for now, not even on our radar. To even to, we shouldn't talk about it perhaps yet. How do we bring these two fields together to start at the very lowest degree of 1% of attention span to prepare for that? So I, I, I do completely agree with you, and, and the, the analogies with the cyber is, are absolutely well taken, um, and many of the same issues uh, are the same. I do think they are coming together. In fact, they're coming together at the Munich Security Conference. Um, the Munich Security Conference, which has been going for 60 years, 50 years, I think, um, uh, more or less for the first time about two or three years ago, it, it linked up with WEF here, and... Uh, the NTI, uh, actually nuclear threats uh, in the US and ourselves, tried to bring together nuclear threats, biological threats, and cyber threats, and think about them in the round of what lessons could be learned from each other. Um, yes. And so it was actually um, one of the high points for me of the last few years when I, when I attended and got the taxi from the train station to the conference, and the guy in the taxi asked me if I was a spy, which I... I sort of felt as if I'd arrived <laughs> at that juncture. But, but you're absolutely right. We no, need to bring we're, these. We're going to ask for one more question, please. Robin Shattuck from Imperial College. Um, the session was entitled Disease X, and modeling along the lines that, that Jeremy was presenting suggested actually for a respiratory born disease X, within six months there would be 33 million fatalities. So I'd be interested to hear what the panel thinks we could start to put in place now that would actually have a dent on that potential 33 <coughs> million fatality figure within that first six months, whether it's regulatory piece, manufacturing, infrastructure, or planning. What could we be starting to do today to so reduce I've asked that figure? So i Seth a similar question, and I'm going to give him the first crack at an answer. Well, I mean, the, the, we, we touched on it in lots of different pieces, but the critical issue first, how quick will we diagnose the problem? Depends where it is, are we set up to do that? But the quicker we can diagnose that there's a problem, then the quicker we get it to a lab, and you heard Julie say, even in the situation of having it sit on the tarmac in Thailand, so how quickly do we make that diagnosis? We talked about new and rapid um, technologies to have platform technologies that might be able to be used to do that. We haven't had a lot of discussion on regulatory. Again, regulatory agencies have been pretty good, I must say, around um, during the Ebola crisis. You know, rather than saying, we'll sit back, we're isolated, you know, you have to convince us. They were out there trying to help, being, what can we do? How do we move things forward? So I think there is beginning to be a set of mindset, but I would be dishonest to say that we got it down and we've reduced all of those threats to where we need to be. And I think this is part of what this iterative conversation now is, is about. There's, a, there's another whole dimension here, though, because this is really <coughs> influenza. And when we were worried about an influenza pandemic, we knew there would be a gap before we had any vaccine. So we had to think about the social measures, again, where employers can be particularly important, but things like being able to shelter in place, understanding early school closures, which was an intervention used in 2009 to, in many cities, we think, fairly successfully. There are a number of these social measures that are not medical in orientation, but do deal with the movement of people, their exposure, their personal hygiene. Um, so there are, there are other um, interventions for a respiratory infection in particular that would likely be implemented in countries that understand and have practiced them. And that's really the secret. What we learned through the years, when I was at CDC, three years of crawl, walk, run, exercising around pandemic preparedness, extending out into the states and local communities. Uh, our department visited every state in the nation with the governors, et cetera, to try to cascade that planning down to the community level. It's really hard and it's very difficult to sustain. And it's not being done in the places in the developing world where some of these diseases may pop up. It's, it's expensive. Uh, so in the last 54 minutes, we've gone through a science fiction scenario, which could in fact become real. Uh, we've heard uh, some facts from Jeremy, and the panel's discussed a bunch of interesting issues. The way I see it is that we have to spend money uh, because what didn't come up in this, this is the World Economic Forum, is the economic costs 
of one of these outbreaks is immense. And rather than spending the money or having the money disappear because of disruption caused, if we can mitigate that, we'll make a difference. So we need to have better diagnostics. And to do that, we need to build a system that is working all the time. Because if you don't have a system that's working all the time, when you need it, it won't work. And uh, therefore, uh, Seth's idea of replacing the polio workers, which are now in a limited number of countries, uh, but something like that, having ongoing surveillance, which is happening here in the first world. Uh, when we have cases uh, that we don't understand, we call for help. And that needs to be something when you push the help button, somebody responds. And that is the first thing to do. So we know, we know we have an epidemic. Then we need to have the trained personnel around to respond, to, to decide whether this is something that we know about. Is it on the panel of known things? Oh, yeah, this is just another case of chikungunya virus. We know what to do. Or in that case, we don't really have a treatment. Uh, but we hope to develop new treatments for it. Or this is something that we don't know. How are we going to find out what it is? And once we find out what it is, how are we going to figure out how to mitigate those cases and then make the vaccines uh, so that we can manufacture that vaccine? It is just like with a heart attack. Minutes mean muscle. In an epidemic, hours mean lives. Uh, because usually the turnover time is such that if you wait just a little longer, more people have died. Uh, and so it's recognition, mitigation of existing cases, prevention of new ones. Uh, and we have the technology generally available. We just need to have the will, the political will, the economic will, and the understanding that without that will, we're not going to make progress. Now, one of the people that have been listening to this is Professor Wang Chen from China. And he was going to summarize what he sees the issues are, because a lot of the epidemics have had an epicenter there. SARS started there. You learned a lot. You taught the world a lot. So tell us what you've learned and what you see ahead. After your summary, I think it's very difficult to make a closing remarks. I just have something to <laughs> emphasize. I think it's a really a new situation we have to face into in the new era. So many things have changed in the past several decades. So we have to go to a new situation, such as uh, gene editing, maybe make a new uh, artificial bacteria or virus, and other so many new things we have to face into, and the climate changing, and uh, the every, so many things. So what I should emphasize here, I think maybe just one point is that the collaboration is most important. And not just the cooperation, it should be a collaboration. Between the info we have uh, in the different part of the world, the, the capability for uh, prevention and management of uh, this biological uh, threats is will be, uh, it will be, it will not benefit to the prevention and the management of these uh, infectious or communicable diseases. So the uh, imbalance is the uh, enemy of to prevention and the control of this sort of uh, uh, biological threats. Uh, threats. So uh, I think it's uh, the uh, collaboration is the most and most important things. That's my uh, remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So we can't become nationalistic. I'll leave us alone. This is a world problem. It has to be solved by the world. So take that forward. Uh, it's a World Economic Forum. You have 60 seconds of time that you had committed, which I'm giving back to you. Enjoy them and use it wisely. Thank you. Thank you.